Yeah, a few years ago, <clears throat> my uh, my house burned down, and I'm, I'm telling you that to feel sorry for me because uh, a lot of wonderful things happened out of that. Uh, but um, uh, the day after the fire, uh, the uh, chief of police, uh, chief fire chief, and uh, three of his assistants were doing their final inspection, going around. I was just standing around, just standing around waiting. I saw a little white piece of paper sticking out of the ashes. And uh, of course, you can imagine, I lost all of my scores, everything. It was a it was total, total, uh, complete job. And I saw a little piece of white paper sticking out and I pulled it out and it was this piece, so it's all water stained and I was just looking at it. And it, it's a piece that I happened to edit many years ago for <clears throat> primarily library collected editions. It's by Hanuman Schein. I love the old uh, Baroque composer, Schein, Schutz, Schein, Tel Telemann, Bach, I'm part German and so uh, I've always kind of liked that. But this piece by Schein, Dimitrin and Zehn, I don't know if you've ever heard it, but his motet, it's one of my all-time favorites. It's just so wonderful. And the chief saw me wiping this off and he said, what's that? And I said, well, this is just a piece of music. I said, this is, this is what I do. And he looked and he saw this German title and he said, what, is it? what does it mean? And I said, it says, those who sow with tears shall reap with joy. And he put his arm around my shoulder and he said, you know, Mr. Ely, I think the good Lord's trying to tell you something. I said, yes, I think he was uh, trying to tell me something. And, uh, but, you know, uh, that night when I was sitting there around the table, my daughter-in-law fixed a big meal and all my kids and grandkids were there and I was looking at my beautiful wife across the table. I had my son's shirt on, my son-in-law's pants on, and my grandson's shoes. And uh, I thought to myself, yeah, it's only after I lost everything I thought I needed. I really have everything I need. But I was looking at my wife and my, my children and, uh, and then my wife died and... Uh, that is a loss that's irreplaceable. And I think that's when the Lord was telling me, I'm all you need. And I know that uh, many of you have had to endure the very same thing. Uh, and if you haven't, you will. And uh, it was sometime after that, you know, uh, have you ever felt so low you had to reach up to touch bottom? <laughs> I mean, there are times when despair is something that we must recognize in our students and in other people. It has a power all its own. And you simply, no matter how hard you try, you simply cannot get relief. But I remember months later, <clears throat> I remember the exact place where I was driving the car and I heard this song. And wow. I noticed something lately that I hadn't noticed for months. Instead of noise, there's music in the traffic and there's laughter everywhere. And I began to see little deeds of kindness everywhere. And around me, there are always the simple pleasures, love, peace, and other treasures. And I just needed to be reminded the differences in me. And I noticed at the end, hearing that, I was smiling. I was smiling. And I thought, yeah, you can, you can take all of your possessions, but you will never, you will never take that intangible spirit of music that's in the heart. And so I told you many wonderful things happened out of the, uh, that as a result. And one of the greatest things that happened is, okay, so <clears throat> the fire is done, it's over. Uh, my wife dies, and I start to get invitations to do things again. Now, if you can imagine, 53 years of collection, and it's all gone, there's no more scores, and uh, there's not a note, and this is before cloud, so everything's gone, and now I'm getting an invitation to come and do something again, and all I have is my own memory, and that's not so good. And so, wow, this was dif that was difficult. That's when I felt the loss. I go to the mailbox, and I get a letter from an Annie Arrington in New Hampshire. 
Now, wait a minute. Uh, I don't know anybody in New Hampshire. I didn't know Annie Arrington. And I open it up, and she says, Dear Dr. Ely, I heard about your fire, and I'm so sorry for your loss. She said, I attended a workshop that you did in Sun Valley, Idaho, back in such and such summer. She said, I, I still have my notes. Would you like my notes? <laughs> yes, I would love to see those notes. I don't know what kind of notes you guys take, but her notes were literally, word for word, everything I said for three days. I mean, it was amazing. Everything that I said was in those notes. It like saved my life. And we've stayed in touch ever since. And now she lives in Washington. And where are you, Annie? Can I have a hug? <laughs> oh, Annie. How precious. <laughs> Thank you again. <laughs> yeah. That is something. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, this music thing uh, does a lot. It carries a lot of weight. Music calms the restless, stimulates the lazy. And this is what I want all the people in our communities to understand. Our society does not understand what music is. They do not understand. They do not understand it like Martin Luther, who says, next to the word of God, the music is the greatest, greatest gift. And you, you are the artist in residence in your community. You have been the designated spokesperson for this great gift of music. And God appointed you to be the spokesperson in your community. Ah, I was reminded of a little poem. You know, I love poems. They compress as much meaning as possible, as few words as possible. But uh, John Finney Williamson, I told you about him last night going to that workshop. I still remember that poem. How many of us ever stopped to think of music as a magic link with God? It knows no race, color, or creed, but gives to each according to his need. And sometimes, <clears throat> okay, listen to this, sometimes even takes the place of prayer when words fail beneath the weight of care. Isn't that great? Music reigns over all of the arts. You don't hire a sculptor to do a funeral <laughs> or a math teacher. No, no, no. Music helps helps the mournful through their, through their funeral. And it helps the cheerful celebrate the wedding. You know why poems are so precious and so important. You let your, let your students know this. When you write your poem, they compress as much meaning as possible into as few words as possible. That's a good poem. So keep that in mind. And I hope that together, actually together, you and I, you and I can encourage the young people to use music, not abuse music, and to know the difference. Okay, good. So yesterday I told you at the very beginning there were three essentials, right? Talk to me, right? Three, okay, three essentials. I went them over very quickly. Let's take them one at a time. Number one, in order to be a productive and a happy teacher, regard every waking moment as an adventure, as an adventure in living, as an adventure in learning. Yeah, every waking moment. Uh, there was a time when I was working on my master's degree, um, my uh, professor said, um, Eve, uh, why are you always so serious? He says, you're so intense all the time. Well, as an undergraduate, I was just fooling around. I was just playing. But now, as a graduate student, I was married and had a child. Now, I started to get feeling responsible. And so, he didn't say, <clears throat> he didn't say to me, do yourself a favor. But he did say something that really meant something to me. He said, you know what you need to do? You need to develop a romance with your subject. 
Isn't that cool? Yeah. Instead of looking at it as work, I need to look at it as an exciting adventure. Every waking moment is an adventure in living. So I was reminded my, my little granddaughter when she was the first granddaughter, you know how crazy parents and grandparents are. And we were out there, all scattered around on the lawn, and watching her just take her first few steps in her little bare feet on the grass. And all of a sudden, she's frozen, just freezing. It looks like she's staring at something. You know, what's going on? You look down her little body, and the only thing that's moving is her little toes in the grass. <laughs> yes. And I was reminded of Aristotle. <laughs> yeah, Aristotle said, we learn first and foremost through sensation. Excuse me? That's important. We learn first and foremost through sensation. You can tell a kid a thousand times, hot, hot, hot. It doesn't mean a thing until they, ah, they'll never forget it. We learn first through sensation. I was attending a class by a very famous conductor. I'm not going to say the name because you all know him. In, a, in another country, in a class, and there was an American student in there, and the student was uh, describing something about Berlioz, and says, I feel that Berlioz was doing something, and he said, stop, you Americans, you always talking about feelings. What does feelings has to do with music? Seriously. This is a world-famous conductor. <sighs> to me, feeling is everything. I've been accused, I realize, I have been criticized by a number of my colleagues, sometimes hurtfully, because I emphasize feeling so much. feely ely they call me, you know? Yeah, as I emphasize feeling, you never get criticized for intellectualizing it. Nobody gets criticized for intellectualizing music. To feel is real. Not to feel is non-human. And I'm not going to apologize. Because I've got Aristotle on my side. And I think every classroom is an adventure. A brand new adventure. And, the, and as adults, I don't think we should lose that excitement of first discovery. Of adventure that we had as kids. So when the student comes in and says, why do we have to do all this old music by some dude who's dead? You say, oh, oh, Johnny, I'm so glad you asked. Because see, creative people like you cannot escape their own style. A composer cannot escape his own style. You see, when you create something, it'll be different from everybody else in the world. And if you don't create it, it'll never exist. So you see, that's why we do Renaissance music, because look at me. You and I are 21st century people, and we are a composite of everything that's ever happened before. So a little bit of the Renaissance spirit still lives in us, and it needs to be nurtured. See, Renaissance music is introspective music. It's restive. It's calming. I always say the Renaissance teaches us how to pray. And the Baroque teaches us how to count. No, no, I mean, well, it's, it's very different. <clears throat> Where Renaissance is restive, Baroque is restless, yeah. Rest, I mean, Baroque is so totally different. <clears throat> Bach motet, number one, the last movement, basis. Ah, let's Sixty-six pages of notes <laughs> without a breath. <sighs> wow. Now, listen. Nobody makes me feel like Bach. I mean, when, when the student first looks at the notes, oh, they don't know that I don't like this piece. But once it becomes a part of you, I don't know why I enjoy doing that. I mean, I don't know why that's so fun, but it is. Nobody lets me feel like that. Handel comes close, but he lets you breathe. Uh, 
<laughs> so a composer cannot escape his own style. The classic period teaches us how to think. I mean, if you don't understand the form that Haydn and Mozart wrote in, you're missing the really important aspect of the music. And Renaissance, I mean, the Romantic, of course, teaches us how to feel. And we relate very much to the Romantic period because it's the closest one to us and we're still writing in a Romantic style today. The 20th century taught us, we're not sure. <laughs> but you, you 21st century people are gonna figure it out. Isn't that exciting? You're going to look back now at the 20th century, figure out. And so you tell that student, Joe, you, know, you see, oh my goodness, listen, Johnny, I just want you to, to do what you absolutely love. Do something, do something special, like write, a, write your song, write your poem. Okay, you don't, you don't uh, paint a picture. Okay, uh, 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 look, build a cabinet. Uh, uh, look, Rebuild the engine on your car. Uh, or, or listen, design the plumbing, the electrical work on a new house. Or, 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 or grow some flowers or plant a tree for crying out loud. But do whatever you love to do. And one is just as good as the other. And so then you say, and now Johnny, I want to tell you, I want to remind you of something. I want to remind you of... Oliver, what Oliver Wendell Holmes said. Now, I don't know, they, said, they still teach Oliver Wendell Holmes, but I love almost everything he ever said. But this is what he said. Listen to this. He said, the saddest thing about our generation is not the pollution of our air and water, as sad as that is. The saddest thing about our generation is not the abuse of our natural resources, as sad as that is. The saddest thing about our generation is that too many men go to their grave with the song still in them. Oh, Johnny, don't let that happen to you. Promise? Yeah. And now, you know, sometimes I talk to you like, a, like you were my students. <laughs> sometimes I talk to you like the professionals that you are. But as a, as a colleague to colleague, I want to tell you, it's more worthy to build a choir with carpenters and plumbers than with professional musicians. Why? The gratification, the greatest gratification comes from helping ordinary people achieve extraordinary things. Yeah. Two weeks ago, I was in Mississippi. One of my former students, she, she had already, already taught at the university, a major university, is now retired. You know what that does to me? <laughs> my students are retired. But she's retired and she's in Mississippi. She goes to a tiny little country church and she's got a little choir of seven singers. And she said, Eve, you always told us to bloom where we're planted. She said, I am planted in this little church with seven people that don't know hardly how to sing, but they are so eager and so excited and so precious. She said, I'm enjoying this more than any time, anything I've ever done in music in my life. Yeah, bloom where you're planted. Yeah. Okay, last night, the last thing we did was sing Jester Hershen's piece, right? I told you that some, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I talk about my experiences all the time because they're the only ones I've had. <laughs> but um, I told you that some of the things that really affected me when George Lynn said, do yourself this favor, and when John Fame Williamson said, look for what's not in the score. Well, this next experience I had really struck home. So my first university job was the University of New Mexico. So I'm down there. And ACDA had their first regional conventions. It was something brand new. Our division met in Oklahoma City. Western division met in San Diego. <clears throat> Who wants to go to Oklahoma City in March? <laughs> and so I told my administration, they didn't know what ACDA was, so I said, I have a convention to go to in the Del Coronado Hotel in San Diego. <laughs> so I went to San Diego. I had such a sore throat, I couldn't see. And that's okay. I sat in the back, overlooking the ocean, and in front of me were like 200 choral directors. And a clinician walked in, and it's Chester Hurston, little short black man, Big smile. 
I'd never seen him before. And he gave a session. And then he said, got a brand new chart. Take it out. Called, I want Jesus to walk with me. You want to sing like that? It was brand new. Took it out. Everybody took it out. Okay, let's begin. So I went, oh, I want you. They sounded just like you did last night. Big operatic voices, lots of vibrato. Yeah, all the way through the end of the piece. And um, you can see all the pens coming out. Oh, good chart. I got to make a note of that. And then Jester, in his inimitable way, went to the chalkboard. He said, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you that if you go to, let's see if this works. Yeah. If you go to uh, Winston-Salem, South Carolina, North Carolina, North Carolina. Ah, oh, find one of these that works. I had a whole bunch that were not working, and I had two that were working. Anybody know where they might be? Uh, maybe, maybe you'll get the point. I'll pretend that you see, okay? So he said, there, if you go in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, to go down to like Bridge and Front Street, something like that, he said, and you'll come to a building that is a pre-Civil War sail barn. He said, it's U-shaped like this. It's two stories, he says, and it has a balcony that runs around in front here and a ramp that comes out here. Now, he said, the animals were all on the ground level. The customers were on the balcony here, and the slaves were brought out on this ramp to be inspected and sold. This woman, <clears throat> her husband, and seven children were brought to be sold by their owner. Couldn't afford them anymore. Two children were sold here, three children here, the husband here, the wife here. Now he said, she has absolutely no hope of ever seeing her husband or any of her children again for the rest of her life. And she has wept. She can hardly, hardly produce any more tears. Now you probably do not understand this, but I want to tell you, human beings cannot live without hope. So she sold to this man in southern Georgia, and he purchases six other slaves, males. And it was the custom of those days. Their, chains are, uh, their legs are chained together, and the male takes the tallest and takes the biggest steps is in the front, she being the only woman in the rear. Now they're heading down to his plantation in the heat in the summer, and they're walking, chained along, and he arrives. And the manager's riding along the side with his, on his horse with his whip. Now, I told you that human beings cannot live without hope. She has lost all hope of ever seeing anything of her family again. So she turns the only place she can. She looks up and she says, I want Jesus to walk with me. Now, Sopranos, when you come in, you are that woman. And the rest of you, when you say, walk with me too, you are those six males. Now on the next page, the owner says, hurry it up, get along, snaps the whip, and that's why we speed it up. Walk with me, walk with me, walk with me, and so on and so forth. It went all the way through the piece. Now I would like to do the same thing with you, but we just don't have time. But then he said, let's sing it again, my friends. Second time through, totally different story. By the end, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. Yeah. So when I did it at home, when my choir came in, I said, men, take off your shoes and put them along the wall. Women, take off your shoes and put them along the wall. What? I said, Don't worry about the holes in your socks or whatever. Just take them off and put them down there. Okay, they're done. Now, men, go over there, pick up a pair women's shoes and put them on and women make a pair of men's shoes and so kinds of laughter and all this craziness going on and they sit down you can imagine some little women's foot in a big shoe or some of the men could barely get their toes in some of these shoes they sat there the whole rest of the period we sang <clears throat> I never said anything but out of 40 singers 38 of those singers talked about it 
And some of my grad students, they talked about it all night long, they said. They got the point. You must walk in another man's shoes to really understand. Now, you're always going to have 2% of the people who would say, oh, that was the dumbest thing I've ever done. They would much rather go in and chase notes, all period, than to learn something about life. Yeah. So then Jester said something that absolutely changed the way I looked at music. He said, oh, sorry about this. Every song has a story. If it doesn't, it's not worth doing. Wow. I believe that. Every song has a story. If it doesn't, it's not worth doing. Every song gives an opportunity for a new adventure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to element number two, and that is be interested in everyone and everything. Why? Because music is about everybody and everything, is it not? Talk to me. Is it? Talk to me. Yeah. Anybody disagree? It's okay if you disagree, but respond, okay? <laughs> do, uh, do you know people like this? Do you know people like this? Beautiful bodies, small minds. <laughs> you know people like that? <laughs> along comes, along comes information. And if anything goes in, it's an accident. <laughs> okay. yeah. But this is not you. No, no, no. This is you. The body might be a little thicker, but look at the size of the mind. <laughs> yeah, much nicer. But you know what? Every one of us, every one of us can improve. We need to develop. Funnel vision. <laughs> do you know people who have tunnel vision? <laughs> of course you do. Lots and lots of people. We need to develop funnel vision. Once you get to the other side, wow, you're interested in everybody and everything. For over 2,000 years, astronomers have studied the universe, just what we can see. In the world today, with a naked eye, only 4,000 stars are visible. Astronomers, of course, look beyond that. But it wasn't until the Hubble telescope was invented and was thrust out there into space. The Hubble telescope today is going around the Earth 387 miles up from Earth. They zoomed the camera into a space. I want you to do this. Hold out your index finger like this. Now put a little grain of sand on it. Just one little grain of sand. You know how tiny that is? Now measure that against the entire universe. Not just what we see here, but all around the Earth. That's a very small space. Do you agree? Very small space. That's the space they honed in on with the Hubble telescope. It saw it in a distance. It got closer and closer closer. And when it got through that space and took the photograph, it absolutely astonished the astronomical world. This is what they saw. You have seen this many times. Many times they will use this photograph, one of the most famous ones, uh, in advertisements all the time. Now you will recognize it. Each one of those lights is not a star. Each one of those is a galaxy of billions of stars. So there were billions of galaxies with billions of stars seen in this tiny little space. That's when they made the comment, there are more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on Earth. OK, excuse me, my brain hurts. I can't take that. 
That's why Einstein says it is immeasurable. The universe is immeasurable. Now, I want to remind you of the genius that's in you as the teacher. You know what genius is? Genius is looking at things as others and seeing what others don't see. Listening to things as others and hearing what others don't hear. Learning things as others and understanding what others don't understand. You walk into your classroom, you see, hear, and understand things in this score that the students have no idea exists. Like that little Mendelssohn piece, Thanks Be to God, we can study it for the entire semester. There's so much in there. When you go and search for the original source of inspiration, and you don't teach them, you just share your excitement. You share your knowledge. You share what you see. You share what you hear. You share what you understand. That's all. You share your enthusiasm. That is genius. Encourage them to develop a little funnel vision and be interested in everyone and everything. Look, <clears throat> I regret the way I taught music in high school before I was interested in everybody and everything. And some of you have heard me talk about this before, but I want to tell you about the worst student I ever had. Everybody remembers their worst student. <laughs> I had a lot of fantastic students, and many of them you forget. You'll never forget the worst student. First student, Horace Burdett. That wasn't exactly his name, but his, his nickname was Horse, because when he smiled, he had this big set of teeth. <laughs> and and the, <clears throat> the principal put him in choir in the ninth grade because he was funking everything else, and everybody did choir, and so, he made my life miserable. I mean, I would pray, Lord, why, why did you put him in this class? I mean, and it wasn't the type of thing that, okay, he comes in, sets a chair on fire, pulls a knife or a gun. Those kinds of discipline problems are easy to handle. You just scream like hell and call the police, you know. But he would do things like, okay, here we are in Palestrina. We had developed this real nice line. We're almost ready for contest. We want to perfect it. And then he would burp, you know, real loud. And of course, everybody laughs, and that's just what he wanted. What do you do with people like that? You can't go to the principal. What did he do? Well, he burped in the middle of Palestrina. Well, you can't. You can't kick him out for that. He made my life miserable. And I don't believe there is such a thing as a tone deaf person, except for horse. He absolutely could not tell the difference between high and low. Well, anyway, he stayed four years. And then, many years later, many years later, they have some kind of reunion in Scottsbluff, Nebraska, and they invite me out in August, in the summer. And I go out there, and it's fun. Now, you know, when you start teaching, the students are only four years older than you, right? And I'm seeing these old people here, my high school students. And I'm, I'm just getting a drink. I'm just starting to take a sip, and somebody goes, what? my back, spilled my drink on my shirt. I look around, all I see is teeth. <laughs> I said, oh, horseman, you remembered me. Yeah, I remembered you. Oh, good. Yeah. I said, yeah, so what do you do? What do you mean? I drive a beer truck and brought the beer. Oh, I see. Good. Yeah. And so then what you do? And then I drive school and I went to Nam. Oh, yeah. You really? You went to Vietnam? Yep. Got shot. What? Yeah, laid me up for nine months and got me a purple heart. But you know what? They put me back up in the front lines again. Got shot again. You know what, Mr. Ely? You were the best, man. You know I hated school. I dropped out of school, but I love choir. Man, you were the greatest. How would you feel? I grabbed a hold of this guy. I hugged him. He put his life on the line for me. I don't remember ever having another student that did that. He needed me. I hated him. I could have done so much for him. 
I can promise you, I promise you with my whole heart, if I had it to do over again, he would be my favorite student. I would take him. I would find out what, he, what is inside of him. I could have done so much for him. Yeah. And I could tell you my least favorite female student, too, but I'm, I'm not going to belabor it except for the fact that she caused a tremendous amount of problems for me and Ramona. <laughs> and uh, uh, maybe 10, 20 years ago, I'm driving to a festival in Wyoming, and I decided to drive my car. And I went through Western Nebraska, a little truck stop. I stopped at Truck Stop Cafe to have a lunch, and uh, the waitress says, our cook thinks she knows you. And I said, oh, yeah? Who is it? Send her out. Send her out. Guess who? Ramona. <clears throat> she's, the sh she's the cook at this truck stop cafe. Oh, Mr. Ely. So you come back. Yeah, three days I'll be coming back. And you, will you stop again? Yeah, okay. All right, I'll see you in three days. I go out, do my gig, come back. Come in the cafe. Hey, is Ramona here? Yeah, she's here. Okay, tell her. Anything. She comes out and sits down. Oh, Mr. Ely. You were just so wonderful. You were my favorite teacher. Oh, she said, I only sorry about one thing. She said, you never signed my annual. Would you mind signing my annual? Her high school annual. Those were the happiest days probably of her life. Yeah. They grow up. Three years ago, I'm teaching as an interim at the University of Nebraska. I do a concert in Hastings, Nebraska, at the Hastings College. My former student's a choir director there. And the bell choir director, who's got a doctorate, comes up afterwards, hey, Dr. Ely, my sister, was your student in Scotts Bluff High School. Yeah, she's here. I'm taking care of her. Here's Ramona again. Little crippled little lady. Oh, Mr. Ely, she takes a hold of my cheeks. And we cried. Those are your problem children that you face probably every day. And what, I what did I learn? Well, this is what I learned from them. Everybody wants to do a good job. If they don't, they just don't know how. Listen, if you keep this in mind, I can guarantee you when you encounter some irritating grouch, or, or <clears throat> some of the, some of those some of those crazy ad menace traitors. <clears throat> when when you encounter some of those people, and you just remember, you know they really want to do a good job, but they're frustrated because they don't know how. It gives you a broader understanding. Uh, provides less stress. And so I've learned that give special attention to a strong student and the weak's going to resent you for it. But if you give equal attention to weak and strong, they'll both respect you for it. Yeah. Okay, very quickly, we go on to the third element dimension, and that is look for the extra in the ordinary. Oh, man, this is so fun. Everything is ordinary in our society today, isn't it? I mean, you've got the little tractor in Mars crawling around. It took them three months to, I mean, six months to get there. It takes three months for the signal to come back to Earth. Doesn't that just grab you? No. We're so inundated with technological events that everything is ordinary to us. But I used to have a film I'd show my students every year. <clears throat> After the fire, it's gone. But it's an old film on the reel, and it was called Art Is. And it was uh, sort of a man-on-the-street interview. And it was in St. Louis, Missouri. Do we have uh, uh, St. Louis, Missouri? And they'd just walk down the street, and they'd ask people. They'd just say, hey, what is art? Art is pretty. Oh, OK. <laughs> what is art? Oh, I like it, yeah. What is art? 
Hmm. Yeah, okay. What is art? Um, it's feelings and words in a picture. I like it. Another scholarship student. I know. <laughs> well, isn't that fascinating? You do that in your class. Every day, you ask some questions. What is music? What is art? What does this mean? In only 30 seconds, everybody pays attention. That was such a neat film. And uh, I've never been able to find it again. But uh, this goes on for about 30 minutes, you know? Asking all different kinds of people, what is art? Here's the point they made. Art is every single thing that's ever been touched by mankind. Not what God created, not, not what nat nature. Every single, in this room, you will not see anything about what God created. Every single thing you see first came into some human's imagination. The seat, my shoelaces. Somebody decided what its function is going to be, what the size is going to be, what the material is going to be, what the weave is going to be, what the color is going to be, how it's going to work. This music stand, this piano, Yesterday, Dr. Miller showed me his new Steinway over there, and he talked about this apparatus that's hidden down underneath and does all this, all this stuff. I wouldn't have known that unless he pointed it out. Yeah. Art, when you start seeing the extra in the ordinary, it is amazing. And so the culmination of that film at the end is they selected one item which is the least likely you would ever think of as artistic, manhole covers. And I'm sorry to tell you this because starting today, you will never walk over a manhole cover without taking notice again. <laughs> manhole covers. In the Middle Ages, when they first decided to put something underground, they needed something to cover the hole. That, that the reason they're round is because it cannot fall into the hole. And they would hire the local artist to design a design that was for this place so that if somebody stole it, everybody would know it belongs here. And if you go to New York City, or New Orleans, some of the older cities, and you see some really wonderful, wonderful designs on manhole covers, then of course America went into the phase of just a plain flat piece of iron with the company's name on it or something. But I'm always noticing the manhole covers and where I, where I run and bike and in my park in Kansas, there is a manhole cover with a sunflower on it, you know, and, and creative things. Yeah, so even manhole covers, to find the extra in the ordinary. So I was lecturing in Michigan a few years ago and afterwards I came home and this man uh, sent me a letter. He said, Dear Dr. Ely, I just want to tell you, I'm going to paraphrase now, because I have the letter right here. He, sa <clears throat> he said, i uh, been teaching middle school music for 30 years. And he said, I am so burned up. <laughs> he didn't say burned out. He said, burned up. He said that all I could think of is how soon I can retire. He said, but after really taking to heart what you said about being interested in everyone and everything, I went back this fall, he said, and I saw my students in a totally different light. Every classroom is an adventure, he said, and all the students are noticing a big difference in me. He said, I am having the time of my life. I'm enjoying it so much, I may never retire. <laughs> and then he sent me this, coasters of manhole covers <laughs> from Budapest, from Paris, <laughs> one from some country I don't know. Hey, <laughs> isn't that something? Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, I would like to end with Deer Chase. Okay. Uh, some, some of you probably think, oh yeah, that sounds uh, nice, those are nice, nice flirty words, but uh, you don't know the 
little idiots I have to work with and the <laughs> lousy administration I have, et cetera, et cetera. But I do know. I do know. I've been there. Taught K through 12. And I don't always do sophisticated classical music. Sometimes you just do fun music. I call it a novelty piece, you know? It's just fun. It doesn't have a big message. So take out Deer Chase. Do you see it? Do you have it? Deer Chase? Talk to me. Anybody not have it? Who does not have it? Raise your hand so we know. Deer Chase? Norman Luboff uh, arranged this. This is an American folk song. It's just kind of fun. Let's just do that. Would you all come down, stand around the piano? Come on, do the impossible. Come on down the stage. Come on, come on, let's go. Can you walk a little bit faster? We're living in an age of speed, huh? I will tell you this, uh, you, know, uh, you know what the philosophy is, we're going to go straight through, right? First time, straight through, absolutely straight through. Come on over, come on over. Lean on the piano here. Come on, come on. Come on, uh, lean on the piano. Yeah. Lubov told me that he, he had this fabulous accompanist with him, and he said, I decided to arrange a piece that was impossible for him to play. So I'm going to ask Zhang to to... It's almost impossible to play at the temple that I'm going to that's supposed to be taken. Okay? Dear Chase, okay, look. You're not going to be able to read the words that fast. So just say la 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 whatever you want to. From the beginning, here we go. And go. Away and away. Oh! 